millions of uh, network users uh, today and thousands of the influx of thousands of more on a daily basis. Uh, performance and efficiency and security in the network becomes paramount and this requires incorporating higher levels of intelligence into the network infrastructure to deal with these challenges. At Nortel we use technologies like uh, web switching and broadband service nodes to uh, in innovative ways which uh, infuse network infrastructures with the intelligence to meet these challenges and this is what we term the intelligent internet. So what is the intelligent internet? Well put simply, by incorporating higher, intel higher levels of awareness into the network infrastructure uh, at the subscriber edge and as well as the core, we have a the network itself has a much greater visibility into the type of traffic it's carrying. This way it can uh, make more intelligent, faster switching decisions based on that type of traffic and at higher layers of the OSI, the OSI model. And, uh, I think that summarizes up. You'll have to bear with me. I have a lot of material here and I want to make sure I get through as much of it as I can. So I may just summarize these types of slides and I'll, I'll spend more time on the architecture type of slides. Um, next slide. So let's look under the hood a little bit and see what the intelligent internet is actually comprised of. Uh, the intelligent internet is, is generally enabled and made up by uh, different kinds of appliances all working in concert. Uh, these will include layer 2 through layer 7 content aware uh, core web switches, which will supply uh, high density gigabit ethernet ports as well as fast ethernet density for uh, server connectivity and for core network connectivity. These will also incorporate specialized purpose-built intelligent processing based on web ports uh, with specialized ASICs and specialized memory requirements, which I'll touch on a little bit later. These switches will also enable uh, specialized IP services, such as security content, security and content load balancing, firewall load balancing, security authentication offload, and VPN device load balancing. Next is a broadband service node, uh, or broadband service node. These provide universal link aggregation uh, for subscribers regardless of the type of protocol or the type of media they're using to access the network. Um, a broadband or service node will also offer IP security services such as IPsec, virtual private, private routed networks or VPRNs, uh, virtual stateful firewalls and also authentication services such as uh, RADIUS and LDAP. And finally, the last component will usually be uh, some sort of a smaller premise-based, customer-based VPN switch, which is capable of doing IPsec tunneling back to the BSN. So first thing, first thing is first. What is a web switch and what does a web switch do? Well, a web switch is distinguished from a tr traditional packet switch by its ability to maintain a stateful uh, web session as well as being able to examine, process, and route traffic at higher levels of the OSI model. Web switch parses deep into the packets for the information layers at layers four through seven, and then makes routing decisions based on set policies and rules. Unlike layer two and layer three information, layer four through seven information is often diverse in length and position in the packet, whereas layer two and three information is almost always in the same spot, and the router knows where it's going to be. Uh, this required to do layer four through seven switching requires powerful and software and hardware combinations as I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, although web switches are typically Ethernet switches with 10100 and gig Ethernet ports, which means they are capable of doing switching at layers two and three, they're more optimized for layers four through seven. Um, a web switch port must have its own dedicated ASICs and its own dedicated memory, and it must have a CPU that's on its own switch fabric so that it does not have to rely on a separate CPU to, uh, so packets do not have to traverse the backplane twice. So let's do a review of the functionality of what uh, the functionality of web switch can provide in comparison to some of the other devices on the network. So here represented in the, uh, the gray column on the left is the OSI 7 layer model. And in the blue column right next to it are, are some protocols that are typically associated with those layers. So as the graphic hopes to demonstrate, uh, the mission of the web switch is that it must be able to process tra traffic at all layers, but as I said, it's more optimized for layers 4 through 7. A web switch can actually work in conjunction with a layer 2, 3 switch, or it can work in conjunction with something like a router, or it can work in conjunction with a, something like a, a broadband service node. 
Um, typically, these will sit in, uh, in large data centers or they will uh, sit in an ISP's point of presence to, uh, to, take, to take traffic from a larger, a larger entity such as a broadband subscriber node. To complete the functionality, a web switch must perform a number of background functions, including server health checking and performance monitoring to make sure that load balancing functions are carried out properly. So in order to accomplish all this wire speed decision making, the web switch needs to have internal architecture that is purpose built for uh, software intensive session switching at higher layers of the OSI model. Web switching is fundamentally different from uh, traditional pack, uh, layer two, three packet switching. Traditional packet switches are designed with high-performance high packet forwarding in mind. Uh, software processing is usually limited to things like SNMP, uh, some routing protocols, some management, and some table, table management. And these are all background functions that can usually be comfortably handled by a single CPU, a shared CPU, um, on the backplane somewhere. As I said, this kind of architecture is optimized for forwarding. Layers two and three information are typically scanned by hardware uh, because they're always in the same spot in the packet um, and can be forwarded entirely in hardware without really any processor involvement. And that's why you get line speeds at layer two and three. However, this kind of architecture is not really optimized for session switching, switching at layers four through seven. Since traditional switching hardware has no ability to understand information in layers four through seven, well, except for some TCP stuff, um, some port, it'll understand ports. Uh, all, all traffic that is to be session switched at layer four must be sent to a centralized CPU, which is the slow path. In this model, the traffic must cross the switch fabric or uh, backplane twice. Once when it comes in the ingress port, it must go across the backplane and must be processed by the CPU, and then it must go back out the egress port. In layer four through seven processing, the CPU needs to be part of the forwarding path so for the majority of packets, hence the centralized CPU architecture where the slower fabric to CPU link becomes the bottleneck when there is a, a lot of session switch type of traffic. To accomplish higher speed and a higher layer switching requires dedicated processing power on web switching ports. The way, uh, the way this is accomplished is to incorporate dedicated ASICs on every port, each with its own dedicated SDRAM cache and all connected to a distributed high speed up to eight gigabit backplane, um, such that all the CPUs on the web ports on the, sw on the web switching module are, are, are load balanced and, and load sharing. A web switch's architecture needs to be purpose built for software intensive se session switching at very high speed. Uh, here using a Nortel, sorry, switch as an example, each switch port contains a dedicated switching ASIC which are interconnected over distributed 8 gigabit per second backplane. Each ASIC has uh, a hardware packet engine for layer two switching and also two dedicated risk processors. And the big difference between this type of architecture and a typical layer two, three switch architecture is that the processors sit inside the switch fabric, not outside the switch fabric. Thus the software processing happens in line. There's no need to traverse the backplane at all. All, all traffic stays, all, all traffic that's bound out another switch port on that same switch module stays local and gets processed in line. This type of architecture enables a switch to do hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of TCP sessions per second, and this is at full wire speed. Um, e even though sites will get, a few sites will get 100,000 hits per second. This level of performance ensures that switch processing capability is able to keep up even if you go through and turn on new features or enable new policies and new filters. This, also provide, this will also provide headroom for growth, which is one of the indisputable realities of the internet. So what exactly is, is done with all this processing power? Well, the web switch performs numerous complex processing tasks at wire speed for each coming, incoming session, including TCP connection setup, uh, processing of traffic rules and filters, uh, session parsi parsing, server selection based on load balancing metrics. Um, a web switch enables load balancing fault tolerance for security applications such as firewalls, SSL offload devices, VPN switches, and intrusion detection servers. 
A web switch enables high speed personalized content delivery through its layer seven content awareness. A web switch can dynamically classify, meter, and manage all traffic flows based on content or other information at the higher layers. A web switch maintains connection states and a state table and enables multiple persistence methods for transaction based and security based services. And finally, a web switch performs background functions like health checking of servers, uh, applications, or entire websites or server farms, and measures the performance of those servers. Now, although I say this is a background function, it's actually pretty crucial to the load balance, well, it actually is the load balancing process. So let's take a look at what a web switch actually does with an incoming web request. Here we'll assume that the DNS lookup has already occurred and that the client is already aware of where it wants to get its content from. So what will happen is, is the client will make the, the TCP session setup request of the site. And in this case, the web switch represents the entire site. Um, so what the web switch will do is actually intercept that request and it will respond with a set of acknowledgement. Then the requesting client will, re -respond, will respond to the web switch's acknowledgement and the TCP session setup is complete. The three-way handshake is complete. At that point, the client will then go on to request the content that it wanted originally. Once that request happens, the web switch will query its server farm to find out which server is most appropriate i.e. which server actually has that content and which server is the least busy to handle the request at the time. Once it finds out what server that is, it will actually go through a separate TCP session setup with that server, such that the, uh, the web server is now an intermediary between the client and the server. It's actually spliced the TCP session into one seamless session for the client. The web server responds with, the, with the, the content that's been requested on its own private IP address because it's on a private subnet at this point. And the web server forwards that content back to the, client, the requesting client on a public IP address. All the while maintaining a state table of the entire TCP session between the client and the server. Um, and in this way, the server farmer is protected behind uh, network address translation and it's also protected by a stateful session that's running through the web server. The web switch, pardon me. So now we have a background on web switching technology. Uh, let's take a look at some of the ways this technology is applied in, in security applications. Web switching technology can be, can be applied to things like uh, IDS, intrusion detection server balancing. Um, as most of you know, an intrusion detection server sits on the LAN or a LAN segment on either the clean or dirty side of the firewall and monitors network traffic packet by packet in real time. However, as uh, the core, core network speeds move into the gigabit and multi-gigabit range, IDS servers can become larger and larger network bottlenecks. Research indicates that uh, IDS servers that sit on the data path can easily handle line rates of up to 100 megabits per second but detection and response capabilities start to degrade when gigabit uplinks are involved, which results in severe performance degradation on the entire network, especially in a distributed implementation. Today, most data center designs are virtually gigabit ethernet everywhere, connecting to a tier of several or sometimes hundreds application and web servers. Uh, obviously, putting a single intrusion detection server on this tier would result in a significant performance degradation of the entire network. But with its abilities to do health checking, load balancing, and performance monitoring, and high speed packet inspection, the web switch is the perfect appliance to do load balancing of intrusion detection servers. It can sit in front of a farm of IDS servers and distribute the workload evenly among them with its, and it has gigabit uplink, or gigabit ethernet uplink capabilities. Here's a brief walkthrough of uh, how an IDS load Load, server load balancing session would look. So a web switch would copy all incoming packets to a group of IDS servers. The original frames would be forwarded to the real destination to try to reduce the latency in serving the content. For each session, the IDS server is selected based on a defined server load balancing met metric within the web switch. Because remember, it's been doing health checking and performance monitoring on the entire server farm. 
Session entries are maintained so that all frames from a particular session are forwarded to the same IDS server. Forwarding, forwarding of IP packets to an IDS server will be done at the end of filter processing or during client processing by the web switch uh, for the case when filtering is not enabled. And then health checks are being constantly done by the web switch to the servers using, using link up, link down in the case that the IDS server doesn't have an IP address, which I think is pretty rare. Um, when it does have an IP address, it'll do uh, health checking a lot of times just simply with ICMP packets or pings. Web switching can be used in, a, in an SSL acceleration offload mode as well. Um, testing has shown that offloading Offloading SSL authentication processing from secure web servers and server farms can increase performance by a factor of 5 to 250 percent. This is because the server processors stay get dedicated to their task of serving content and not to authentication and encryption. Um, SSL offload also enables centralized management of SSL keys and certificates. So an administrator doesn't have to go to each secure web server and keep the certificates updated. Um, the web switch in the middle all of it will enable the content switching for secure web sessions in case you have several secure servers that are, have different goals and missions and content. Uh, this is a scalable architecture because you can do hundreds of SSL sessions per web switch SSL accel accelerator appliance combination. And you can manage and load balance several SSL accelerator appliances with a single web switch. The web switch will coordinate among them and monitor them for the best availability. Uh, here's a little walkthrough of, of how an SSL offload ac accelerator might look. Um, here we have a, an internet client, we have some web servers, we have a router, and in the middle of that we have a web switch. Then off to the right we have a, a dedicated SSL accelerator appliance. So what will happen is the client will send an HTTPS request to what it thinks is a secure website. Of course, the web switch will intercept that request and redirect that request on port 443 to the SSL offload appliance. The SSL appliance will then complete the SSL handshake with the web server and then initiate an HTTP connection to the switch on port 80. Then the web switch selects the real server based on the configured, lo configured load balancing policy that you've already set up. And again, it has metrics to know which server is the most appropriate to handle that request at any given time. Uh, the server will respond to the HTTP request and reply, and reply to the SSL appliance. The SSL appliance will then encrypt the session and send the HTTPS client response to the client via that splice TCP connection I talked about through the web switch. Uh, another application for web switching and security is load balance switch firewalls. In a traditional firewall pr approach, the uh, Firewall is a security speed bump with major limitations for expandability due to a single processor for packet creation, driver management, OS, and packet inspection. Traditionally, firewalls have been a bottleneck in a network requiring several firewalls or even several layers of firewalls to handle the influx of traffic on a busy network. By using high-speed web switches as a, as a hardware accelerator, the offloading of traffic from the firewall inspection engine can be done at gigabit speeds while maintaining full security. When used with a separate firewall director appliance, the high-speed traffic parsing capabilities of a web switch can be incorporated into an accelerated switched firewall system. Using high-speed dedicated web ASICs that I described earlier, switched firewalls can parse, filter, and switch traffic at speeds approaching wire speed, which enables simplification of the firewall structure. Fewer appliances to manage, configure, and monitor, and fewer ingress points means less vulnerability. Another inherent security feature in the web switching that I described earlier is delayed binding. Delayed binding is the method by which the web switch intervenes between the client and the server during the TCP session setup process. Uh, then splicing the two TCP sessions into one, into one transparent session to the client. By doing this intervention and controlling the TCP traffic, the web switch is the perfect control point for monitoring synchronization and denial of service attacks by watching half-open TCP sessions. The server is protected from the SYN attacks, and the web switch can trigger an alarm notification when half-open TCP sessions exceed a certain threshold. Meanwhile, and then send traps off to the administrators. 
And then meanwhile, while all this is happening, since web, web switches are typically deployed in a load balance pairs or in farms, if a legitimate user's request comes along, it can be rerouted through another web switch on the same network. Uh, back to the appropriate server with little or no appreci appreciable latency to the requesting subscriber. So even though I've been focusing mainly on security applications today, web switching is an extremely comprehensive capability. Uh, hardware accelerated wire speed traffic classification and content based switching intelligence enable a wide array of services uh, like the security stuff, the uh, site protection via switch firewalls and load balanced IDS servers. Uh, acceleration of secure web sessions via SSL accelerator web switch combos. Uh, maintenance of connection states and enabling multiple persistence methods including cookies and uh, for transaction based and security based services. Load balancing of web app and application servers for site performance and throughput and high av availability. Content aware layer 7 switching to optimize server deployment and maintain persistent client connections throughout a web session. Bandwidth management and quality of service to prioritize session based on content found at the higher layers. Personal content caching appliances that accelerate web servers by serving frequently accessed traffic or secretly access static content to users and offloading the web servers. And again, background functions like health checking servers, applications, and entire websites, and measuring the performance of the servers, which again is very important. Now that we have a background on the web switching aspects of the intelligent internet, how do we scale this technology to accommodate hundreds of thousands of subscribers, students, employees, or whole or large organizations, many of whom are probably accessing the network via device protocols and methods? Further, how do we build in security and service flexibility appropriate to the needs of whole or organizations, individual users, or everybody in between? Well, this is all made possible with a device known as a broadband service node. Broadband Service Node is a single platform which offers both universal link aggregation and a broader web array of IP services for tens of thousands of subscribers per unit. A BSN resides either at the edge of the network or in the core as a point of presence for a large organization, an internet point of presence for a large organization, or an ISP. Um, a BSN will reside at the edge of the network or in the core. Um, again, it's Sometimes a revenue generating device for an ISP, sometimes it's just simply an aggregator for a very large network. Um, the BSN enables service providers and enterprises, learning institutions, military bases, uh, basically anybody with a lot of network users to uh, centrally provision highly customized IP services including firewalls, virtual stateful firewalls, virtual routed um, IP networks, uh, bandwidth management per, per VPRN, and quality of service mechanisms such as DISSERV, MPLS, and even ATM quality of service mechanisms, and content awareness. Broadband service nodes are the next generation of multi-service access devices that not only provide access to the network via diverse connectivity methods, but also provide IP services which enhance the way that people use and manage that access. As I mentioned, a BSN is protocol and media agnostic, basically, providing connectivity from legacy frame, relay, ATM circuits, cable networks, DSL networks, wireless networks, uh, all flavors of Ethernet. I think we may even still do FIDI, I'm not sure. Um, but typically, as I said, it will be deployed as either a private internet point of presence for a large group, um, or it will be a revenue source, a point of presence to the internet for an ISP. A single BSN can replace rackfuls of high-speed legacy physical routers by provisioning virtual routers on its backplane, logically separating tens of thousands of single subscribers or single subscriber networks into independent virtual IP networks. Adding new subscribers and provisioning new services is literally as easy as adding a new card and then turning up the services in the service creation software. High subscriber density and powerful processing enable network managers and ISPs to save real estate by replacing rackfuls of legacy routers, VPN switches, access devices, remote access servers with a single device, and other various service appliances that take up a lot of space in the switch room and require a myriad of different trained personnel to manage. 
One of the most powerful services available is something like Broadband Subscriber Node. It's, it's called the uh, Virtual Private Routed Network, or VPRN. A VPRN is a Layer 3 VPN, which is essentially replaces an organization's existing point-to-point -point routed infrastructure, um, whether that be a leased line, frame relay, or ATM backbone. Um, VPRNs are created using the L2TP, L2TP tunneling protocol in the case of a single user out in the network someplace, or triple DES encrypted IPsec, which is becoming the de facto internet standard for key encryption, um, authentication, and key exchange. The VPRN emulates a multi-site routed network, essentially appearing as a cloud to the subscriber edge devices, typically using smaller uh, this, the smaller edge devices typically use a, a premise-based VPN switch. Within VPRNs, virtual routers are provisioned to take the place of physical routers. The BSN will then use widely deployed network address translation to separate the multiple private VPRNs from the registered internet. A single, BC, a single BSN may contain multiple distinct, fully featured virtual routers, each with its own routing tables corresponding to a different VPRN. Although these virtual routers coexist on a BSN, they are absolutely separate and cannot be routed between. This is necessary for a couple of reasons, A for security and B for practical reasons. You may have a couple of different subscribers on one of these that want to deploy similar IP, private IP addressing schemes. Uh, in other words, you may have a couple of different subscribers that want to do a 10 net or a 192 net or a 172 net and something like, like this enables that. Security is applied on a per VPRN basis. Site to site transport is secured and encrypted via, again, triple DES IPsec IP tunneling. Or in the case of an individual dial up user, L2TP, using IPsec software on a PC. <laughs> Virtual stateful firewalls can be applied on a per site, per VPRN, or per subscriber basis, and then that service can be managed by the individual. These and all other BSN services are provisioned provisionable on a per subscriber or a PVPRN basis. But what really differentiates a broadband service node from routers or remote access devices is the word service. The concept of the BSN is to be more than a broadband remote access server by managing flexible IP services for all subscribers regardless of the size of the subscriber. Uh, this could be, again, this could be a, a dormitory, a military base, it could be subscribers to an ISP or an ASP. It's, it's, it's a very broad reaching device. And each of these groups will always have different unique service requirements. The broadband service node enables provisioning of these IP services logically without the need for separate external appliances for each subscriber. For instance, a small branch office in a larger organization may have a requirement for managing their own stateful firewall. The parent organization can logically provision one of these for that branch office. And then the branch office can manage it on its own, on its own as though it were a separate appliance sitting in its own switch room. The breadth of service, service capabilities of, of a BSN is pretty wide. And uh, quite honestly, each one of these is a presentation unto itself. So just let me summarize a little bit about the provisional services that you can provide via BC, a BC, BSN. As I mentioned, the virtual private, private routed networks, this is the ability to logically replace most site-to-site -site infrastructure and appliances. Uh, it can replace legacy point-to-point -point networks with virtual networks complete with virtual routers over a common private or public infrastructure. And then subscribing organizations would only incur last mile costs, and then they would have to provide something like a, a customer premise VPN switch to interoperate with the BSN-based VPRN. Stateful firewall services, available on a per subscriber or per VPRN basis. And again, individual organizations, or whoever that subscriber happens to be, can take control of this firewall as though it were sitting in their own switch room. Network address translation on a large scale. Um, this protects private VPRNs by proxying registered internet IP addresses uh, it allows organizations to make use of large private IP subnets. An organization can provision their own class C subnet if they'd like to, um, which adds security to the, to the private network by protecting um, everybody behind a private IP address. Um, this also prevents IP address exhaust in the registered internet, 
And uh, this is also considerably cheaper, as anybody that's ever tried to buy a Class C registered IP address can attest. <coughs> Content filtering and steering. A BSN has capabilities which complement web switch capabilities by performing some level of packet inspection, filtering, discarding, content steering, as in content push. ISPs will use this capability to put advertisers advertisements on their clients on their clients' PCs when they launch a session. This is good for individual sus subscribers that may have some content switching uh, requirements and needs and wants but don't necessarily want to make the investment in their own web switched infrastructure. They can simply sign up for this service via the broadband service node. Quality of service and traffic management, a full array of QoS mechanisms are available, including DiffServe, traffic prioritization, traffic policies, uh, ATM, quality of service mechanisms, and again, these should all be provisionable uh, on a per VPN or per subscriber basis. And finally, accounting services. Uh, complete tracking of bandwidth and usage per subscriber. This capability is most necessary to organizations like ISPs and ASPs uh, who use something like a BSN to generate revenue. However, a capability, capability like this is uh, also an essential capability for the private enter enterprise or the large organization to track, in, to track metrics and try to figure out, try to quantify what their return on the investment in this technology has been. And then finally, the individual subscribers would need something like this so they can uh, track their own metrics and figure out how to scale the network to meet their future needs. So to sum up the intelligent internet, let's uh, revisit our slightly altered architecture diagram to see how web switching and BSN technologies can work together. This is how it might look, say, on a college campus. Let's say this institution has an online registration website and several servers that physically reside in the main admin building. These need to be accessible via the internet. They need to be reasonably fast and they need to be absolutely secure because people are using credit cards to sign up for classes online. Also, the main college website is here, which gets a lot of hits, particularly in August. And uh, this is a perfect spot for web switching. It's a perfect spot for SSL offload capabilities because the registration web servers are secure web servers. And of course, the student records databases and accounting databases are highly confidential, so we, have, we absolutely have to have some firewalling capabilities here as well. So since credit card numbers are involved, and since the admin department has a huge budget, they go ahead and make the investment in their own web switching and security appliances. So really all that they would require from the BSN are uh, internet connectivity and VPRN membership. Let's continue to say that this campus has an engineering school, and this engineering school has developed a distance learning program complete with their own streaming video servers. Additionally, the engineering school has their own intranet that's pretty busy, so they have some web switches in place to do some load balancing. They provide the, the streaming video via SHTML servers, so they're going to need some web switched SSL offload as well. However, since they do have streaming video involved, they're going to need some quality of service mechanisms on their internet. So they choose to sign up for DiffServe on their, on their IP links. They also need to sign up for a staple firewall to protect their intranet, but since it's not a terribly secure network, they figured that they can, uh, they can bypass doing, they're not going to get that many hits, so they figured they can bypass doing the load balance firewalls and simply sign up for a state wall, stateful firewall service from the BSN. So from the campus BSN, they would need a stateful firewall, they would need a quality of service enabled via VPRN, and then they would just need VPRN connectivity and membership. So there's an off-campus admin facility that's about a mile from the campus. The staff here takes care of some in-person registration, and there are also some accounting and student record databases here that need to synchronize with their counterparts in the admin building on campus because this is sort of a virtual server farm. Since the main admin building has already deployed web switching, it's already deployed SSL offload for its secure HTML authentication, really all this building needs is a way to get back to the admin VPRN. 
And for that, they've taken, they've gone ahead and deployed an IPsec VPN gateway or a smaller premise-based VPN switch. So really all they need is this switch and a couple of T1s and then membership to the, the green of the admin VPRN. Student services. Student services have their own intranet and they have email servers if they want to be load balanced. And they get significant traffic on these, so they've gone ahead and made the investment in layer two through seven core web switching. But, from the BSM, they also require basic firewall services to protect their internet servers. They're not, again, terribly secure because the email servers are on a domain and they take care of their own authentic authentication, so authentication, so that service is not required from the BSM. However, they do require accounting services because they provide in-dorm internet access to students that are in the dorm, which is a bill pay service. So they need to know how to track and bill that. So now that we have our infrastructure in place, let's bring in our users. We have tra traveling faculty who may be anywhere and do need to get back to the VPRN to see what's happening on the engineering intranet. So they may want to access the BSM via dial-up connection and then just do IPsec client software on their laptops. We have resident faculty who live on or around campus and have gotten DSL or, modem, or cable modem service that's actually provided by the campus. This is a very progressive campus. We have students in dorms. The dorms are relatively new and wired for data, so there's an Ethernet connection back to the BSM campus. As I said, this, this, this internet access is a paid service, and student services using the accounting capabilities of the BSM to track and build them. Finally, students in classrooms definitely need to get back to the engineering school network, and they can do this via Ethernet um, drops in the, in the classrooms. And then finally, everybody needs internet access, and the bandwidth for all these internet uplinks, again, is provision of on a, on a BPRN basis or on a single subscriber basis. But the thing to notice on this slide is that there are very few legacy routers, if any. There are very few registered IP addresses. There will be a few with the public interfaces to the network, but almost everybody on this slide is hidden behind network address transfer. So to sum up, um, I'd just like to summarize the technologies which enable the intelligent, intelligent internet. Um, new generation web switch architectures enable deep packet parsing, line rate switching at layer seven and layers four through seven. Load balanced switch, switch firewalls and SSL offload devices for security. Load balancing for internet um, intrusion detection servers. Stateful session establishment via delayed binding. Global application of web, web server load balancing. I didn't get too much into web server load balancing, global web server load balancing, but that's a method by which, I sort of touched on it a little bit, you can have a virtual server farm and servers don't necessarily need to be co-located. You can have a set of web switches located just about anywhere, as long as there IP, there's IP connectivity between them, they can still monitor the state and the performance metrics of all the other servers somewhere on that network. And even if a server isn't physically co-located next to that web switch, it still be, may be the best switch to, uh, to service a request at that time. Server health checking. Um, link up, link down, pings, very important to the load balancing process. The broadband service node. The concept of the broadband service node is to transcend the, uh, the traditional access router or remote access server by adding services to bandwidth. Protocol and media agnostic, a subscriber ideally needs to be able to get back to the network regardless of how they're going to do it, whether it's dial-in, DSL, could be a wireless network, um, could be an ATM or frame relay network somewhere. VPRNs, the ability to replace legacy point-to-point -point routed infrastructures with logically provisioned independent networks that share a common private or public infrastructure. And IP services, virtual stateful firewalls, quality of service mechanisms, accounting capabilities, uh, bandwidth management available on a P per VPRN or a per subscriber basis.
basis. So that's about all I had. I painted these technologies today with a very broad stroke. Uh, there's hours of material on all this stuff. Um, if you'd like some more information, I'd be happy to give you my card. Or if you'd like, you can just go to the, uh, the Nortel website at www.nortelnetworks.com, which I know Pat knows what that is. Um, we have white papers there. We have specific product information if, you, if you'd be interested in that. So I encourage you to go there. And I think that's all I had. I'd be happy to take any questions. Back to slide 23. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand the DPRN concept. Your, your blue, uh, purple, and green line that's leaving the DSN out to the internet yes. really is not quote unquote colored at that point, is it? When it's no longer carrying tag information that relates to the specific DPRN, it's now going out as to the public internet. There's nothing on the other no, end of that. Right. When it makes what? it part of the BTRN, right? It, it could. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's just traffic that's bound for the internet, for the, the internet at large, it'll go out, say the BSN is connected to the internet there, it'll have, in that scenario, since those three BPRNs are, are different entities, mm -hmm. it'll have three distinct per, uh, public IP addresses. But, okay, so let's say a student in the dorm. Yeah. And they're on the, the light blue, we'll just call it that, DPRN. Right. All right, now, if they go to Yahoo, which is not on the DPRN, mm -hmm. to look for some books, mm -hmm. Yahoo has no concept of the DPRN. Right, that, that's so. correct. Once it, once it leaves the, that particular e internet, e or internet ingress port, I guess it would be at that point, it is no longer tagged with the DPRN. So this, the DPRN really does for layer three in the internet what VLANs did at layer two. And that's exactly layer. right. That's and, exactly right. and, and the NAT that you mentioned is exactly opposite of the current NAT, where you've got a legitimate public IP address internally, mm -hmm. and now you're you're slapping a another a DPRN address that won't uh, that's non-public for it to go out on within the DPRN, right? Well, no, you're mask you're you're proxying a public IP address. No, actually, in this case, we're proxying a, a private IP address with a public IP address. Like, for instance, oh. the students in the dorms are on a 10 net. Okay. So it's just like classic. Uh, yeah, it's, that's, it's okay. classic NAT, but on a really large scale. Sure, you're not going to be able to. You're not going to be eliminate to eliminate all of your appliances. I mean, there are going to be some. For instance, the BSN doesn't necessarily terminate all the networks it talks to. Like, for instance, if you have a DSL network, you're still going to need a DSL access multiplexer, and then you just run something like like a DS3 from that to the BSN. But what the BSN is, it, it's more protocol agnostic in that it can it can take inputs from that particular multiplexer. Uh, it'll take inputs from a modem bank. Um, it does have some serial cards that you can put in there to dial directly into it. It can serve as a dial-up access server if you deploy if you chose to deploy it that way. But yeah. well, in our off-campus admin scenario too, we haven't eliminated the, the requirement for them to have a separate IPsec VPN gateway. So there will still be some peripheral appliances involved to get back to the network. But what this allows you to do is eliminate some of the routers. And is a, I'm, I'm just trying to grasp, but is, is, is it a lot different than just looking at a you know, nifty racking environment, or is it something it, else? It is quite a bit different in, in so far as traditionally to achieve connectivity like this, and we, we could be talking 10,000 users here. You need a rack full of really high performance routers with a lot of different interfaces to achieve this kind of connectivity. And even then, they may be parallel processing routers, they may not be. Um, what this allows you to do is it allows you to consolidate all that real estate and all those services into a few, into fewer chassis and then terminate different kinds of networks and provision different virtual private networks. Is that is there, is there a common, uh, well, routing scheme sort of in 
inside this thing? I mean, is it, do all these separate? It's, right, it's, it's divided up in what's called contexts. Contexts will use, usually be used for, uh, you'll have a large ISP with maybe smaller ISPs. Um, they'll divide the VS sound up into contexts, which are, are absolutely separate. Um, a context can contain several VPRNs or several virtual routers that are just fully featured routers. So you have all these discrete different set, different contexts happening on the same on the same backplane that are physically, I guess, sort of co-located, but they're logically absolutely separate. network wants to, some, a host on that network wants to go out to the internet, ping a, a public IP address or go to a website or whatever. If it traverses a NAT enabled routing device, what the NAT enabled routing device does is actually takes the incoming private subnet packet, strips the private address out of the packet header and, sub, and substitutes, it, substitutes its own IP address and then sends the packet on its way. But then it maintains a stateful connection. Well, not so much if you have a stateful service set up, like a, a web switch or a stateful firewall within the BSN, it'll still maintain a stateful connection between, e even on an outgoing basis if you want it to. Um, so it will be aware of the private address on one side, the public address of, on the other side, and then it'll splice, via delayed binding, uh, it'll splice the two TCP sessions together. But to answer your question, isn't it's simply... It still, isn't it still an IP bottleneck then at that point? I'm just wondering how, to what extent that mechanism can avoid the Yeah, it's pretty processor intensive, but that's why a box like this, it, it's a pretty huge capability because I think the Shasta is capable of using symmetrical processing with something like 166 uh, power PC chips. I mean, there's a lot of processing power in there. Um, so yes, NAT is fairly processor intensive, but then again, it's only happening at layer three. You know, it sees an IP packet, sees that it needs to be NATed, strips out the private IP address, put, puts in its own public IP address, and sends the packet out. Um, so there is some processing, but it's, it's not that intensive. A quick question on the, the web switch. You said deep packet inspection layers two through seven. Mm -hmm. I assume it's doing that for efficiency of switching and security reasons, right? I mean, you don't need to look at all those layers just for right. efficient switching. Right. Yet you still have a load balancing firewalls. I'm wondering what the firewalls are there for that this this web switch was looking at all layers of the, of the stack here can't do. Well, it's just a way to distribute the workload. Um, the web switch, you might want to have, I mean, again, this is just a theoretical um, deployment here, but you may want to have the web switch basically doing more concentrating on load balancing and, and, and performance checking of your, of your web servers and you might want to have it more dedicated to serving content. Um, the switch firewall is actually, the way Nortel deploys it, a switch firewall is actually two appliances. The appliances on the left up there are uh, actually packet accelerators. It's called a packet director. And what it does is, is it actually goes through and applies the filters and it does the, the firewall stuff. Um, and then the web switch, which is the core switch in the middle, does some load balancing between them even. So really what we're looking at is a uh, a conglomeration of two different types of appliances. But you would expect to feel them together. Yes. If you wanted security. You yes. Would, you wouldn't uh, rely solely on the web switch for security. You probably wouldn't, although you would rely on it so much for for traditional firewall type of things. But like I mentioned with the delayed binding, it does maintain a stateful session. Um, so it, it does maintain state tables. It's aware of the entire session until it's torn down. And it will know if there's a sin attack or a denial of service attack coming. So, and plus it does perform that. So there are two security functions there. Questions, I'm going to follow up on your, your web switching. Um, if you're going to be subjected to a distributed uh, attack mm -hmm. coming from multiple IP addresses, I believe so. I, I think the web switch, what it'll do is, it'll, 
I think it becomes stateful after the first, after the TCP session is set up. I think it'll assume that packets coming in from a, from one IP address once a session has been established are okay. But if it sees an inordinate amount of like ACK packets coming from from one IP address or from another IP address, if it sees anything wrong in, in the session setup or the session continuance, then it'll send out a it doesn't really have a mechanism to shut down in that case, but what it'll do, it'll send is it will send out a trap that different addresses or different something is wrong in the TCP uh, session setup. You know, something it'll look in its tables and say, okay, if this is a good session, then why am I getting so many SYN requests or why are there so many ACK requests in there? Um, and then once those requests start to fill up the table, it'll just fire off a trap to the admin and say you're under attack. You mentioned how many processors the BSN can have. Um, what, what about the web switch? Because um, we were talking about the, mm -hmm. that for quite a while. Um, how many ports are possible on the web switch and how many processors? Well, the web switch, each web switch, switch will have its own independent CPU. Um, it really kind of depends on the form factor of the web switch. Um, in Nortel, we have, as I said, we have. You know, I can put 64 web switch ports into that chassis if I want to, but I'm probably not going to do that. I'm probably going to have several web switches, each with, say, 8 gigabit web switch ports, and then uh, attach uh, servers to them on the gigabit ports. But each one of those ports, regardless of the speed, has its own dedicated uh, risk processor and its own cache of SD RAM. But, they're all, but they all coordinate over a single distributed backplane on that web switch module. Now I can use this same switch and put two, two of those type of modules in it, and then this switch also has a centralized CPU which can handle the layer two, layer three type of uh, switching and traffic from just regular um, Ethernet ports that go into the switch. So it really kind of depends on, on how you provision your switch. But for the web ports, they all have, they all have one central CPU, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the, the actual chip is, what the actual processor is. 